Bonjour à tous. I'm switching to English. Uh, today we're welcoming uh, an author, blogger, influencer. Uh, Gerd Leonard will talk about the future of media. Please welcome Gerd. Thank you. Bonjour à tous. Good morning. I speak some French, but I won't torture you with it. So, uh, I'm originally from Germany. Don't hold it against me. Um, I lived in America for 17 years, so if I speak too quickly, just wave and say, slow down, okay? Because I picked up a bad habit from America. So I'm going to talk to you today about telemedia futures. You probably have no idea what that is. That's what I'm going to tell you. If you're into time wasting, I'm G. Leonhard on Twitter. Uh, take out your Blackberry and fire away. I'm going to take questions through the tweets, so all you have to do is uh, put the hashtag, which is hashtag USI2010, or my handle, G. Leonhard, I'll, I'll see them here. I'll take a look occasionally. I won't answer my email, so I'm just looking at that. Okay, so thanks very much uh, for inviting me to Pierre. This is what I do. You may wonder what a futurist does. I mean, obviously, nobody knows the future. Nobody can predict the future. So really what I do is I look at trends and ideas from all over the world. I live in Switzerland, but I work in, in about 20 countries, uh, a lot in developing countries. I develop ideas for my clients. Here are some of my clients. They include Google, Nokia, Siemens, uh, media companies, newspapers, technologists. Uh, I work mostly in the overlap of content and technology. So, uh, as you can imagine, it's a quite interesting space to be right now. I have an iPhone app. If you have an iPhone or an Android, it's a Media Futurist with a gap in between. Media Futurist, you can download it's a free app. Um, I will put the PDF from the presentation online in about two hours or so. If I can find a reliable Wi-Fi, I will get it up there as quickly as possible. You can download it at mediafuturist.com. So, first of all, um, clearly, This is the world that we're living in today. We're in a world where people are connecting to each other everywhere. Not just the kids, but pretty much everywhere. Now, the, the biggest growth on Facebook is the 25 to 45 year olds. Right, so we're living clearly in a world that's to what I call the new normal, that we actually are connected. And this is now happening in Africa, in Brazil, in China, in Indonesia, worldwide. The other three billion, as people say, there's actually a company called the other three billion, They're getting connected. And we're getting connected on ever faster and hopefully cheaper, except for Apple, cheaper devices right, and better devices. So what's happening here is that, uh, for example, now we see in the last two years, Google's contribution to global internet traffic has gone up from 1% to 6%, and it's probably going to be 15% or 20% in two years. Right? So the traffic that Google is causing through email, through YouTube, of course, ultimately YouTube is the biggest factor here, is exploding. So what that means is really that the telecom companies are now saying, well, you know, we have a bit of a problem because everybody's using the network. For example, if you use an iPhone, it's 50 times as much as using another smartphone. Using the iPad, up to two or 500 times as much power you need from the network. Right? So you're creating a huge load with all these things and all people doing all kinds of things, but who gets the value? Who gets to participate in the value that's being contributed? So now you have here the chairman of Telefonica said about Google just a few months ago, they should share some of the online advertising revenue because they're using our network more and more. So the head of Telefonica thinks that Google should pay extra and cut them in on the revenue of the, using the online network. Right? This is a classical food chain conflict. Right, who gets to make the money from those activities? But the bottom line is that this is sort of what we're looking at right now. It used to be the internet means this. You know, a workstation connected with wires. Today, the internet is all about mobile devices. And I don't mean telephones. I mean basically any mobile device, including connected eyeglasses, suits, wristwatches already exist. Right? So this will explode. Clearly, people in Brazil, Africa, Indonesia are not going to go online with this. I mean, that's basically all mobile devices, so that's nothing new to you. But here's a, uh, a graph from Cisco talking about the traffic that we can expect. And the traffic is, I mean, we're only here, right? Look at this growth here, right? In terms of data load, terabyte a month. The biggest amount of traffic will come from video. 
because everybody's getting into making videos, for example, short speeches of the CEOs, product videos, how-tos. You may know a company called On Demand Media. They make videos based on keywords. They're the, most, the fourth most popular video provider in the world. So they look for popular keywords, for example, pole dancing or, you know, beach or whatever, right? Pole dancing is very popular. So there aren't enough videos. They go and commission people for $200 to make videos, and they make 5,000 of them, right? They make, and they, they are creating all this traffic, right? So now, we're going to see video and audio and peer-to-peer -peer and data, of course, becoming the majority of the power that's taken off the networks. So then you can wonder, if the telecoms, ISPs, operators, are not getting involved with content, how are they going to participate in this, what happens here, right? Social media, mobile exchange of, of data and information. So that's a huge shift we're going to see here. Bottom line is, I mean, everybody knows, of course, the mobile has taken over, but this is basically what we're looking at, right? It's all, everything is going to be in the cloud. Education, money, music. Music already in the cloud, but illegal. Okay? That's why we have Hadopi, I guess. Oh, not a bad idea. But anyway, Everything is supposed to move in the cloud. I mean, if we're, we're not going to have education with books, right? I mean, Africa, also people are not going to use books in five years. They're too expensive. Yeah? It's so cheap to buy a tablet device, not an Apple, right? $10. You can buy already in China. Yeah? And it's going to probably be less than that. $10 for a connected reading device. The governments will buy 100 million of those give them to everyone and buy a subscription to an online library for a dollar a month. Uh, that will be a lot cheaper to them than printing books. 99% you know, of books are, be, are being recycled. Right? People throw them away. And almost 99.5% of authors never make money with books. So clearly that's a trend we're going to see there, that things are moving into cloud. I think a huge business opportunity is to connect the crowd, the people with the cloud, right? The crowd and the cloud. And that's going to be a major challenge for all of us because basically what's happening here is not about actually shipping bits and bytes of movies or books or so. The content itself isn't as much the business as the process of connecting, which I'll talk about in a second. Content is a very powerful business, of course, very important business, but it's not about making copies. Right, so, so far we've had what I call the copy economy. You know, records, DVDs, iTunes, copies. So now we're moving to an access economy, which is great actually for the content creators. Not so great for people in between. But anyway, so what this means is that in, in some way this has to be an open system. Because if the cloud and the crowd aren't connected in a standardized way, in an open platform probably won't work. Again, with the exception of Apple, right? It's a completely controlled platform. I love Apple, by the way. I have an Apple. And I have an iPad. So this is just stating a fact. So Marshall McLuhan, who really was the first smartest futurist, what is the crackling sound that we have here? Um, he said, it's the framework that changes, not the picture. So I can't tell you how many times I get asked by companies to come and do a social media seminar. Right? What in the world is that? What's what, social media? I mean, Twitter, Facebook? That's like a Band-Aid, right? So you have a wound and the, the arm is bleeding, you put a Band-Aid on. You know, you basically think that you can fix the problem by putting a Band-Aid. So you're looking at the picture, not the frame. The music industry is famous for this, right? They look at the picture. The picture says, guy downloading for free, bad picture. But the frame is what matters, right? The, the, the behavior change, how people have changed in consumption, that's the frame. So we have to look at the whole framework, not just the picture. And uh, if we look at framework changes, that, that's the past, right? It's walled gardens, content, telecoms, politics, energy, America, walled gardens. Right? We lived in this way for a long time. That's, I'm not saying it's bad, that's just the way it worked this way, right? Today, we have this. All right, we're switching to an open platform ecosystem, which with some exceptions, but by and large, for example, Twitter, 150 million users, 
75%, I think it's actually 80% now, of all the traffic on Twitter comes to the API, the application platform interface, which I don't have to explain to you. Everybody in the world can go inside of Twitter, take all of their data and do whatever they want within on top. There's 2,450 companies who live on top of Twitter. If Twitter goes offline, they are also offline. I'm sure you've seen that, the whale, right? So YouTube, 75% of YouTube traffic is coming from referrals and links, people sending links to each other. Have you seen a poster ever on the street saying, please watch videos on YouTube? They don't need it. Right? They're all going through APIs, shipping the traffic to others. Right? It's a whole different couple of ideas, basically the idea of being open. SlideShare, you guys know SlideShare? Now people, instead of applying for jobs, they put up their stuff on SlideShare. That's the resume. You're looking for a job? Just look at my SlideShare, how smart I am. That's the resume. Right? It's creating an open platform. And the world, you know, is getting to be pretty noisy. I mean, there's no sound here, but you can imagine, right? I mean, we have all these options, email, SMS, uh, watching videos on the fly, watching television, and so on and so on. I mean, basically, in the process of uploading and sharing and consuming and doing all these things, the connectivity, mobile and social, is a pivot point in society, similar to the printing press. Gutenberg, ring a bell? Okay. The church hated Gutenberg for the very simple reason that you weren't supposed to publish the Bible with a machine. Right? It was supposed to be written with a hand by authorized people and only in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. Not in German, not in French, and definitely not made with a machine. So Gutenberg made a deal with the church. The church did not like Gutenberg. They made a deal, and it became the biggest driver of the popularity of the church, after all, which until today, things have changed. But anyway, so what we're seeing here on the web is very much the same thing. Right? A lot of things that are cool on the web are not legal in the strict sense of 50 years ago. Right? That is a process that's going to change. I mean, what we're seeing here is that the process of being open is going to take over. And if music publishers or record labels or film companies or book publishers don't embrace this process, they'll be irrelevant. I mean, you heard this before, but the reality of all of this is that's where we're going. It's like the horse shoes in the train. Right? You can like horses, but people don't travel with horses anymore. They took trains. Now they take airplanes. I mean, these things change, and we have to adopt. So this is only a question of time until we sit at home and we have on a connected television every possible YouTube, Hulu, Netflix channel available at the click, right? And of course, who's doing this? The master of all disruption, Google. Here's a quote from what they're doing. Uh, tell us exactly what it is. Google Solid demo. Television. What is Google TV? And also, you guys are a disruptor. Who is this going to threaten in the cable and television worlds? I'm not sure who will be threatened by it, but I sure know that all your viewers who are watching television would love to right now be able to check things on the internet, have it all be integrated, and immediately go back to watching our interview. The fact of the matter is that television has not been reinvented in any significant way since color television was brought in in the 1960s, with the exception of the larger screens. Now, all of a sudden, because of the power of the processors that are inside these televisions, you can run a full internet browser and have a full internet experience could never do this, not even last year. So all of a sudden, you click a button and boom, there you are at the internet, and you go back and forth. What's going on in sports? Where are my shows? Where are my YouTube videos? And even more interestingly, you can download programs and program your television to do exactly what you want. But all I would need would be a high-speed internet connection. Would I need a cable provider? Well, the cable provider you still need because, one, they typically provide your high-speed internet connector, which is always useful. And more importantly, you're going to need that cable content. So what we do is we build the platform, but the content you're still going to subscribe from, the, whether it's a satellite or a cable provider. Well, that's what he says, right? But the reality is really quite simple. It's like the content that's growing on the web isn't from the major studios. Right? In overall proportions, 800,000 petabytes of information are available on the web. Most of that is produced by all of us, uploading images, forwarding, rating, all these things. And the content proportionally that grows the most is not the, the official, the, the content from the major studios, but it's all the independent stuff, all the smaller stuff. And that's just now starting to be relevant. It actually wasn't relevant until now. 
the whole idea of the long tail. Right? That's just now starting to be reality. So basically what we're going to see here, take TED.com. You guys know TED, the TED conference, right? Yeah. Well, how, how is it that it's not the Discovery Channel or CNN that's the most influential video site for thought leaders? 150 million views a month. It's not the Discovery Channel, it's not the BBC, it's these guys who make conferences. They're not even a TV company. They're the most influential site in this, in this segment, in this niche. Right? And then we go to you know, Boxy and Hulu. I mean, people are going to skip cable, basically, uh, in the next few years. That's a whole debate about why do I need cable t television if I have the internet? We have this fight at home. My wife wants to watch regular television. I never watch regular television. You know, I program my own television. And when Google TV comes, you know, I'm really going to think about, do I really need to have cable? Because from the 100 channels that we're watching, maybe 2% or so is what we actually want, and the sports or whatever it is, right? So cable, television versus over the top is going to be a big fight that is quite clearly in this direction. Now, we've lived in this world for a long time. This goes for advertising, marketing, media, the watering can. Right? We all watch the same TV shows, see the same ads, drive the same cars. Well, maybe not that, but France have different cars. But. So we lived in this world of saying, OK, whatever I can get. And this used to be five years ago, if you're a kid, you download whatever music you can find. Right? Because you were in BitTorrent or LimeWire or whatever, you download 100,000 songs, and then you would play 40 at the next party. That has changed today. Kids don't even download anymore. The honor of being downloaded for free is over. Right? Now it's this. Right? It's basically the idea of saying exactly what, when, how, where I want. It's a whole different paradigm. Right? Today, if you go to a party, a kid's party for music, what do they do? YouTube, Daily Motion, Meta Cafe, Songza, Spotify, whatever. It's not even download, it's just streaming. Today, for kids, content is a link and a click. That's it. It's a click. So we're going away from the era of the watering can to the era of the funnel. Attraction. Pull, pulling people into the funnel. That's better for most people. Because clearly here, we're going to see a lot of niches that at a very low cost of distribution can be distrib distributed worldwide. The question of business model, of course, comes up, which I want to talk about. But what we're seeing here is this company called The Other 3 Billion, O3B, is half funded by Google. They're putting up 18 low-flying satellites around the world, 16 already up, two more going up, to provide free or very low-cost internet access to all the other people, African, Brazilian, China, Southeast Asia, and so on. Because Google can't afford to wait for the telecoms to get their act together for fast connectivity. I mean, really fast connectivity. Because their boat isn't floating enough. You know, they only make 2.7 billion a month. So they need a little bit more power in the network. And when we all get online, right, we're basically, we're going to see this. I mean, Le Monde was just purchased by the guy who owns free, right? That's telemedia. Right? And we're going to see this convergence of people who provide access with those that make the content and those that filter the content, previously called publishers. Now, where is this going to happen? Well, it's not going to happen here in France or in Switzerland or Germany. Or I mean, it may happen, but it will take longer. It will happen in the developing countries. Look at the growth of GDP. Almost all of the growth of GDP globally is happening in the BRIC countries. Uh, this is the, uh, the dark line, the dark blue is the BRIC countries, the rest is Euroland, right? Here? And the USA. All these things will happen in those countries because of the lack of legacy, the lack of issues like uh, regulation. I mean, they have regulation, but not like we do. This is obviously going to happen there first, and of course, we're going to see this quite clearly. The internet has completely changed. 1996, 66% of the internet was US. 2009, 15%. So guess where we're going to see all these huge changes? Telecom companies buying publishers, publishers becoming telecoms, and so on and so on. We're going to see it in those countries first. 
And of course, the trend is that the phone users, you know, regular dumb phones, right, they're all becoming web users. You think this is sort of trivial because it's obvious to us, you know, here because we have the money to buy these boxes, right? But in Africa, for example, where the phone is so dumb you can hardly do an SMS, that's it, right? But these phones are all going online now. We're looking at this pyramid here, 1.5 billion roughly on the internet now, it's actually a bit more. But really, this is the interesting part, right? All the phone users are becoming web users. And they'll be doing entirely different things in terms of what they consume, how much they're willing to pay, how they buy, how they pay, you know, how, what they do, and of course the unconnected, that's the next level. Right? People don't ha even have a phone. Uh, that's still a very large chunk. So we're right at the pivot point. You know, we thought, 1999, we thought, okay, internet is going to be everything, right? So we lost all our money trying to figure this out. But now, 12 years later, or whatever, 11 years later, it's actually happening. It wasn't wrong, it was just way too early. So, basically, the other thing that comes into is that we're having an interface revolution. The interface of the iPad and similar devices is a touch screen. My mother can go on the internet and watch movies. Right? I mean, with this kind of interface, right. anyone can do it. Right? This is not a question of a uh, you know, marketing trick or so. It's a whole different idea of how we interact with machines. Right? So it's the natural user, the end UI, not, not the GUI, that we're looking at. Right? And that's really going to change. So, High-speed connectivity, social connections for everyone, natural user interface, that means basically a huge paradigm shift. And so that brings me to this point, we're looking at total convergence. Every single uh, industry in the world wants to get to those people. And the black ones are the ones that are influencers. Right? Everybody wants to get to the same people, so everybody basically is converging. Cable and satellite people want to get to those, internet giants and the telecoms. Everybody wants to get to the same place. The cable guys are saying, please buy our cable for 50 euros a month. You can watch ESPN or the History Channel or whatever. And these guys are saying, you don't need the cable guys. You can take it for us for free, download everything you want, and so on and so on, right? I mean, we've seen those debates. So what's happening is that we're going to see entirely new business models and new roles. We're going to see a convergence of copying and owning of print and digital, and of course, web and television, right? completely converging. The only way to save the television business, and of course that's what they're doing, is converging it with the web. And we're seeing this across the board, right? The cloud and local storage, selling copies, providing access, converging the two. Clearly television isn't over, I mean it's always going to be big television channels and mass media, but the chance to make money in television is with the complete convergence of the two. Right? And that's what we're going to see in the future. So Gutenberg, right, we've seen this, clearly the issue of control was a big issue with Gutenberg 400 years ago. Right? How would the church know this guy isn't going to change the Bible? You know, or put an extra page in, or a hyperlink, you know, whatever. We have to face this, right? Basically because we're connected, and people are interconnected, and now they're empowered. I mean, look at the airlines, right? We can do the same stuff that a travel agent could do 10 years ago. We have the power to do that now ourselves, right? So we're gaining control as a user, but as a provider, we're losing control. Right? That's inevitable. That's across the board. If you look at the entire food chain, that's basically what's happening. If you make cars or newspapers or music, little choice here. It's a consequence of being open. I mean, if you're going to go to a bar and you want to like to meet people, right, you can't put a wall around yourself and say, well, how come I haven't met anyone? Right? Clearly, you're not going to meet anyone if you're not open. Right? You're not going to go forward. Right? So there's a risk in being open. You may meet somebody that will rip you off or play a trick on you. Right? There's a risk in being open. But on the other hand, if you're not open, you'll never get anywhere. So do we have a choice here? This is the choice, of course, of the media companies. This is the, really the vexing problem. Right? You want to be open and go forward, but if you are open, you're taking a risk of being exposed, potentially being ripped off. So the world until now, really quite simple, you know, industrial 
hyper-capitalism that we had in America, big companies, small consumers. Right? Now the world is this. And actually, of course, the fact is, it's really kind of both. I mean, we still have the other way, too. But if you're looking at what's happening around the world, especially in the area of your consumer brands or so, now it's basically us who are getting the power. For example, Google, right? Google is completely dependent on us. Because if we found out that Google would use our data and, not, and publish it without asking us, we would all get off Google very quickly. And they'd be dead in six months. I mean, we hold the collective power to kill those companies. We think they have a lot of control over us, which is also true. But at the same time, it's quite different than Microsoft. Right? We could stop using Microsoft 15 years ago. It wasn't really an option. There wasn't much of an alternative. Right? Today, we can switch to Bing if we want, if we trust them more. So now we're going into a new social interconnected mobile operating system. I'm not talking about technology. I'm talking about your head. The operating system that we're switching to is mobile, social, interconnected. And if these guys, the former big fish, want to be part of this, they have to be open. And we're seeing this basically everywhere, with very few exceptions, like Warner Music Group or Sony or EMI. Right? I mean, if you want to play in this space, you're going to have to open up. Right? That's, I mean, even Microsoft is now donating code to public domain. Adobe. Right? Adobe is publishing some of the SDKs. Google is the biggest provider of open source code in the world. So that's, that's not really rocket science, right? So it's very scary, that part. To take those new roles, you know, telecom, media, advertising. I mean, if you go to an operator that has 120 million users, some of my clients have 100 million users. You talk about advertising media content, they just crawl into a hole. Because right? for them, it's like they're engineers. They make, they build systems. But do you have a choice? You have to ask this question. Do you have a choice not to participate? I mean, this is basically what's happening now across the world. We're doing that here in person now and through Twitter and Facebook. But basically, the process of talking is exploding. And business to business as well. 51% of people on LinkedIn have said that they have made a business deal through LinkedIn. They found a business connection, and 40% of American CEOs are on Facebook. And what are they doing there? They're talking. Right? They're learning. They're selling by talking. Right? So where the conversation around the content, the sort of idea of a new kind of advertising, that's taken off on a global level. We have to forget about advertising that we know in the past, which was all lies, noise, you know, stuff we didn't want to see, interruption, that is not going to work here. And we're talking about a trillion dollar budget here. I mean, this is not trivial money, right? 500 million, billion dollars in advertising, roughly globally, and 500 billion in data mining, marketing, public relations, corporate communications. It's a trillion dollars. So this thing, this is a great video by Scholz and Friends, it's a German agency, you can check it out on YouTube. It shows what people are doing today, and then this video shows how advertising works in the future. Rather than running skyscraper ads on the website or putting up outdoor advertising, you create a game. This is a BMW app for the iPhone. You give that to people for free, that's the ad. Right? So content is advertising, or advertising is content. Right? You play with this, and before you know it, you've developed some sort of following relationship with BMW. So that's a new way of interactive advertising and then spreading it, of course, to, to your network. Right? So again, going back to the beginning, this is going to go to 20%. Google's impact on the traffic will be 20%, largely because of YouTube and all other kinds of video services. And they will buy Twitter, of course, which will help. Right? That's pretty much guaranteed, as far as I'm concerned. Handset traffic per month is going to absolutely explode. I mean, how are you going to cope with that if you're an operator? You don't make any of the extra money. Google makes all the extra money, and everyone else, but not you. Facebook and whoever they are, right? Cisco, bottom line is ISP and mobile registers. To do nothing is not an option. Not to do this 
to move up into what I call telemedia is not an option. And you've seen this in Asia, every single telecom company wants to become a media company or telemedia company. Not produce media, that's different. Even though some are doing that too, like Orange, you know, obviously has a TV st a studio. But most telecom companies are now saying, well, we have to move up and become a platform. We have to participate in all the things that people are doing currently on top. We have to engage to lubricate this process. And Denmark, the state telecom called TDC, has a flat rate for music. The only place in the world where free music is legal is in Denmark, uh, and in China. Different story. <laughs> no, 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 really legal, and it's not a joke. But anyway, in Denmark it works like this. TDC has said, okay, we'll pay 15 million euros. We get all the music streaming and downloading for all of our users, all the DSL connections, the wireless, and the mobile included. It's a flat rate. Turns out that people love the service, even though there's copy protection, even, which is crazy, but it's still working. Right? So when you're a user of T uh, TDC Telecom, the music is de facto free and legal. You can take off the copy protection, right? you can share it. And it turns out it's the biggest asset for TDC is the fact that people don't want to leave because they have their playlists and their friends of music on the service. Now, why does it work in Denmark? Well, in Denmark, there was political pressure for this sort of thing to happen. Right? In Denmark, it's a small country, nobody cares. Okay. We're going to see these systems around the world. It's much better to have a commercial arrangement for flat rates than to have a law to get people off the internet. I mean, the lawyers make money off this. I don't have to talk about that here, but clearly that's a big issue here in France. So, there's a company called Open Research. And what they do is they look at the telecom markets. So I'm borrowing some of their slides. And they're saying, OK, there's a choice. If you're in the telecom business, you can be a smart player, service management applications, and so on. Or you can be a lean operator, low cost enabler of networks. But guess what? Of course, lots of people want to be smart, not just the telecoms. So put yourself in the shoes of big mobile operators. You've spent billions of dollars of building the network, buying the licenses, rolling all this out. Now all these guys are coming and saying, hey, Greg, we use your infrastructure, your flat rate. We build our own business, and you keep on paying. So this will force those companies to go up and say, OK, what Sony is doing, British Telecom can do. What Vodafone is saying, well, you know, clearly, if Apple is going to build all this stuff on top, maybe we should be involved as well build our own app store and do these things, right? Create value on top. That goes with this, basically the increasing disembodiment of content. All content that we know is becoming digital. Pretty much all content, except for sculptures. Right? So what that means is that the business of making this content, of delivering it and sending it out, is going to be absolutely humongous in a new business model. As I was saying earlier, now today, for people, content is a click. I mean, if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, if the video, the movie, the music, the book does not exist with a click, it won't be looked at. It's basically when my kids go somewhere and they click on the, on the computer and they're not connected, they're saying, what is go what's going on here, right? They're not connected, so that doesn't exist. You, you disregard it. This is why paywalls won't work for the most part. You can't say it won't absolutely work. But in most cases, it won't, right? Because it's about the click and then the money, not the money and the click. That's the reality that we have to live with. We can want it to be different, but it's not, right? I mean, this is basically the consumer behavior of 4 billion people is this. And now we can argue, of course, my mother isn't doing this. She doesn't know how to do this. But give it two years. Give it two years, and the devices will improve so quickly that if we don't use this in our business model, we won't be there to look at it. So most content is a click, or now it's a sweep, right? Using the tablet computer. Even worse, because a click requires some sort of geekiness, right? But a sweep, yeah, one sweep, download the world's library of music. That's what we're Hello, looking at. Hello, and welcome to the mobile demo of music streaming service Spotify for Google Android. Now, we're going to give you a quick run-through of the mobile app we unveiled at Google I.O. Still a work in progress but we thought it would be cool to show you a little preview.
First question on many people's lips is how you use Spotify on your mobile when offline, say on the underground. And the answer is pretty simple. Just select the playlist you want made available offline and they'll sync automatically. Six million songs are available on Spotify, which is uh, started by a guy in Denmark. They've made deals with all the major record labels. Uh, now, basically, Spotify is giving us what we talked about, mp3.com and so on, 1999. The virtual jukebox. Music is in the sky, I use whatever box I have, I just click a few buttons and off it goes. Anything you want, anytime, anywhere, if you're on the airplane, you can use your buffered library, 2,000 songs, I think. <laughs> Big problem here, of course, is the commercial model, right? Because at this point, of course, Spotify won't survive this because there's no way for them right now to pay what it takes to the labels to make this work. Right? So we're in the same spot again. We're replacing copy with access, but there's no provision to figure out the business model until the access is there, the chicken and the egg. Right? So now the advertisers are switching to the model of supporting these things, but it's still behind, right? So this is a big challenge, but if you place your future into the copy economy, you're in deep trouble. No matter how you look at it, whether you like the deal or not, it's going here. So that's, I think, what we're going to see with Spotify as well. But just a quick definition of what open economy actually means, I'm sure you're aware of this, but new business models based on hyper-collaboration. For example, Safari Books in America has teamed up is uh, Tim O'Reilly, with all the competitors to deliver a, mu a uh, service of books, 15,000 books for $40 a month. You can read all of them, download all of them, just tap into the pipeline. Total transparency, conversations, not monologues, which is called you know, social media. Passing control to the user, open interfaces, APIs, use of technology standards. I mean, that's all easier said than done, clearly. I mean, the idea of it is pretty simple. Right? But to pull it off is not easy because by nature, we're much more happy with control. Clearly, control is something that we understand. Right? So that's quite a shift that we're going to go into. But look at this, right? Basically, what we're seeing here is that the growth of the world's data, 75% is going to be user-made data and content, right? Tags, ratings, forwards, likes, you know, all these things that we do every day. That's made by the user. So very simply, I think, the increasing amount of this, what I call meta content, is going to really drive a lot of businesses, which brings me to the ultimate conclusion here, really. Data is the new oil. It's not for me, by the way. Found it on the web. But it's a good term. Right? I mean, think about this for a second. Right? Oil was the most powerful driver of economy, wars, and everything in the last... I don't know, 50 years, ever since Henry Ford. Right? So now all of a sudden we're finding out that really what we're doing on the web, we're generating huge amounts of data. Every day we're clicking, doing something, Twittering, creating content, sharing stuff, PDFs, uploading things, right? We're building mountains of data. So whoever gets to mine the data, right, to pull it out, to refine it, to legally use it, right, that's trillions of dollars. That's, of course, what Google wants to do, and now Apple as well. Eh? It doesn't just have to do with advertising. It has to do with permissions, with marketing, with research. Today, you can use simple pieces of software like Jammer. You can go on the web and read what people are saying about you, and you can make a huge report about consumer opinion about what you do in half an hour. It used to take 50 focus groups and $500,000 to figure this out. Now you just get the Jammer. So this will be a major driver of the telemedia economy, data being the new oil. And we're getting a little bit tight on time, so I'm going to skip a few slides. As you see, I have plenty. Now, we'll be here tonight if we go on like this. <laughs> well, we can, we'll still be here tonight anyway. But so what's happening is that telecom now is becoming a space that is combining content, advertising, and social media. This is a place where all these things are going to converge. And I think we're looking at a future to where that business model is really only powerful if it's all of these. 
It's one of the issues that we're looking at, of course, in the content industry. We'd like to have some sort of recipe, like cooking a pizza or something. Right? Well, the reality is it's not. It's a moving target. Right? It's different in each country, in each culture, at each time, in each medium. Right? So the combination of this, based on the fact that data is the oil, uh, that's basically, I think, where we're heading towards. And advertising, of course, is going to change. I mean, if you're looking at the old paradigm of advertising being yelling, right, essentially, on the internet, on the mobile, we're not going to accept this. We don't want this stuff on our mobile, you know, yelling about useless stuff that we'd like on television. Yeah, we're not going to accept this, right? So clearly, here, I think 30% of all advertising budgets, $300 billion, will be shifting to digital, interactive, mobile, and social. Because of the recession, lots of companies have said, OK, we're going to cut back, reevaluate. But now they're saying, well, we really want perfect tracking. We want to use our money differently. Right? That money is going to shift in all these things. And $300 billion of advertising is going to support a hell of a lot of content. I mean, the entire music industry is 18 billion. Right? I mean, if you're looking at the context here, clearly, Advertising has always paid for content, along with taxes that we have in France or in Germany, right? public taxes for television and so on, which I, I don't support, but they're here, so we have them, which is not always bad. But anyway, content in the future will also be supported by advertising. It hasn't worked until now, but it will. So I'm going to head towards the end. I want to take some questions as well. Do we have time for questions? or? Uh, Okay, I'm going to do a bit of a summary, okay? So, the world being rather confusing, which I'm sure is not news to you, it's a constantly moving target. Here's a couple of fixed points that you should look at, in my view. The cloud. Everything is moving to the cloud, so accept that as a reality and figure out a way to connect the crowd and the cloud. Mobile, right? Everything is mobile. It's not about these devices, it's about mobile. Social, location, open platforms, and APIs. Like connecting with other assets, data is the new oil. So the very final slide, sorry about that, <laughs> yes? I know it's a, it's a terrible thing, but you know. So this is a summary. If you are the telecom business, it's about disruption, lubrication at the same time, taking new roles, hyper-collaboration, and creating web mobile native business models. Thanks very much. I'm going to make this available, the entire show, even the 50, 100 slides that we, that we didn't have. I'm going to make this available on mediafuturist.com, and we don't have time for questions, do we? No, but you can. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>